the, the kayakers were accessing through, interrupting the, the fishing experience, interrupting the kayaking experience. And after quite a while, we negotiated a, a successful arrangement where the kayakers simply make a phone call. Uh, you, we, we escort you down on the road. You're, you're bypassing a lot of fishing area and, and calm water. Uh, you had to portage the canoe or kayak sometime. Uh, it's a lot more pleasant experience for all parties. Nobody's getting interrupted on their fishing. Nobody's getting interrupted on their, on their paddling experience. And you get to the good water. American Whitewater has a long history of working on river access issues, not just in Colorado, but across the country. Here in Colorado in particular, we are working with a broad range of partners and stakeholders in trying to address this river access issue, and we've been working on it for decades. A court case in 1979, the Emmert case that everyone refers to, basically says that there is no right to float in Colorado. In a later attorney general opinion of that court case, tweaked it just a little bit. Current law is that the water that you're paddling on is public water. So if you stay on the water, you can pass through any kind of property that you want, uh, unencumbered, you shouldn't get harassed, you shouldn't get ticketed, you shouldn't get arrested. So that part I think is pretty settled. Where, where it becomes difficult is what do you do if there's a strainer, if you need to scout, if somebody swims, if you need to get out of your boat. And generally the rule is incidental contact is allowed and what the exact parameters of incidental contact are, are still to be decided. This year, the issues on the Taylor brought river access back to a boiling point, and we're seeing now, uh, you know, differences of opinion between landowners, that they're no longer on the same page. We see more examples of landowner paddler conflicts cropping up all across the state, and it's all stemmed from this new interest in deciding whether the public has a right to use our waters and does that include the right to flow through private property. So people have assumed that if I own land on both sides of the river, in Colorado you own the land underneath as well, that I then control the public access to the stream that flows through my property. Under Colorado law, it's very clear that a river or waterway cannot be obstructed. So if a landowner obstructs it, then you have an absolute right to walk around that obstruction if it's an intentional obstruction. Now, where the issue plays out is when a landowner legitimately fences the property that he owns, which they can do, then do you have a right to pass around the fence? And my answer is, of course you do, because they can't obstruct the river and you have a right to protect yourself. One of the unique pieces of river access in Colorado is that it comes to a head and then it'll fade away for a couple years. We may reach a a solution, whatever the hot issue that year is, we may reach some sort of resolution with the landowner. Things sort of die off for a couple of years and we've had this really quiet truce with landowners for a long time. You know, all the property owners in this country didn't, it, we've always gotten along, everything's been fine. Uh, we respect them and they've respected us. We've not got out and had lunches or going to the bathroom or you know, throwing things in the river. We respect the river as much as any landowner would respect the river. This is a resource that I don't want to see changed or damaged, probably more so than the landowners. But recently, people have come in with a different kind of attitude, and it's an, it's, it's an exclusionist attitude. It's, they want the river, they want it exclusively for them and their use and not the public, and it's a public resource, it's a public service. So what's happening today that is most significant in this right to float issue is on the Taylor River in Gunnison County between the cities of Gunnison and Crested Butte. The Taylor River is a, a dam controlled river. It flows through a really scenic gorge. There's a lot of appeal because it's got healthy trout fisheries, it's got healthy white water. You know, the river system itself is, is very pristine. Because of that, there's a lot of interest in owning a piece of the Taylor River. And we've had in the last several decades, a lot of folks come into Colorado buying up large tracts of historically productive agricultural land and using it as their own sort of trophy hobby ranch or subdividing the property. In that process, they end up buying both sides of the Taylor River. And we've seen this resurgence in the landowner's interest in setting aside the Taylor as their own little slice of heaven, their own little private piece of waterfront property. And they have approached 
um, commercial outfitters and the general paddling public and said, you can't float through here anymore, even though we've been doing it for decades. The, the problem came about when one of the outfitters received a letter that I will, and the landowner basically says, uh, Lewis Shaw is the landowner who has, uh, would like to do a development there. I will allow you to float through this season, but not next season. And very nice letter, but very straightforward, and with the assumption that he had a right to be able to say people could not float through. So it's pretty crazy coming out here and seeing what's going on. There's obviously uh, a group or a gentleman who you know, truly feels like they own this section of river and can police it and, and do what they want with it to the point where they're actually putting um, you know, obstacles in, in the river that could, could be dangerous to rafts. It's really ugly. It's barbed wire strung across the river at head height. It's low bridges. It's uh, you know, rebar strategically placed so that if uh, you didn't know it was there in advance, it, it would rip your raft and you'd be left without a craft and you'd be stuck in someone's private property. And what's your alternative at that point? You have to walk out. And the act of walking out is a trespass act. So it's a malicious attempt to discourage paddling through private property. It's intimidation in the, in the way that the message is being communicated. And you can't negotiate with someone who says, you cannot float through my property. You know, there are half a million people that go rafting in the state of Colorado in the course of the summer. And economically, it's a very, very good industry for Colorado. And to pretend we're just going to shut that down, it would be like saying we're just going to shut the agricultural industry down. It just doesn't seem to be a fair resolution that we're going to stop you from doing something. Paddlers come from all over the world to Colorado. And it's for whitewater recreation. It's for whitewater rivers. And we paddle virtually every single river in the state, from our headwater streams to our steep creeks to our wide, meandering desert rivers. And only a handful of these recreational resources are actually navigable by definition. How many other rivers do we paddle on in Colorado? All of those are undetermined. Do we have the right to float? That's the question. So on the Taylor Agreement, um, at the request of several people, and the governor, the two commercial outfitters, Scenic River Tours and Three Rivers Rafting, met with Lewis Shaw group to come to some resolution, at least for this summer. I believe what was signed was a five-year agreement. And that agreement talks about how many boats can come through per day at what times they'll be coming through so as not to interfere with the private fishing that may occur off the development property. So what's evolved over time is kind of an uneasy um, detente, I guess, really, between uh, boaters and landowners and public agencies that manage the rivers over who can float, when you can float, and what, what you do if you get into trouble. There are hundreds of landowners that own property along a stream, and it's, it's unwieldy to think that all those agreements should be worked out individually. They're, they're, these are ad hoc solutions to a problem. It's like, what would you do if every time you wanted to drive between here and Denver, you had to negotiate annually or monthly or in some fashion the right to pass through somebody's private property? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a horrific solution. It's, from a commercial perspective, it's expensive. I, I don't know where we got off track to thinking that, hey, just because I own property, I can block a navigable uh, stream. But I think it's not until people make enough phone calls to the legislature that a bill will be passed, and that bill will probably end up going to the state Supreme Court for resolution. And I think it's it's not going to happen until enough Coloradoans insist that something be done. If we don't stay in the fight, if we don't keep working away at this issue, building partnerships, building good, good relationships with fishermen, with private fishing clubs, and with landowners, we will see river access potentially slip away.
As river enthusiasts, anyone who enjoys the river, floating down it, fishing on it, so on and so forth, it's very important for us to voice our opinions because the people, the general population driving next to the river, they don't understand and their life is in a different place. It's up to us to voice our opinion, literally email or call or write our legislators and let them know that we want to float these waterways. And if we don't do that, that right could get taken away.